The jarring strike of the clock in the towering cupola drew Frank Claymore's unwilling eyes to the two-story courthouse. It was a Texas Plains impression of some forbidding old-world castle in which monstrous crimes had been wrought upon the innocent. Claymore had opposed the construction of this gray stone insult, just one of many fights lost as the years stole his strength and diminished his influence. His taxes, reluctantly paid, had gone far toward building that courthouse. Now he was being tried in it, and the wolves were at his gate. A deputy sheriff slouched at one corner of the hotel's front porch, trying to be inconspicuous as he watched Frank Claymore with nervous, weasel eyes. There ain't no job too low for somebody who don't want to work, Claymore thought darkly. Muttering, he moved toward a bench, attacking the floor with his cane at every step. It was hard to come to a tolerance for this kind of attention. For a time now, until just lately, it had seemed that hardly anyone except Homer Whitcomb and the hired hands paid attention to him. Older people didn't count for much anymore. He muttered a bit louder, taking crude comfort from Mule Skinner language that had always been therapeutic. Homer was at his elbow. You say something, Frank? He took Claymore's arm and tried to help him toward the bench. You just sit yourself down. Be a spell yet before court takes up again. Yonder comes the prosecuting attorney to dinner, him and that whole pack. Claymore jerked his arm free of Homer Whitcomb's solicitous hands. I can set myself, thank you. Instantly, he regretted his irritability, but he knew he would react no differently the next time. Long years of struggle had etched a belligerent independence into his grain, as time had conditioned the gentle Homer Whitcomb to overlook such provocations and permit them to leave no track. It had long galled Claymore that Homer showed no evidence of rheumatism, of stiffened joints that ached in protest over every quick move. Homer's hair remained indecently dark, though he was by two years the older. But then he had never been run over by a herd of cattle, had never carried a flint arrowhead amongst his vitals. Homer had what Claymore regarded as a hound dog face, loose-skinned and wonderfully pliable, falling easier into smile than frown, seeming usually to harbor some private joke that he savored like old wine. To Claymore, a man who bore so little worry on his shoulders was shirking his responsibilities. Claymore pushed aside a newspaper he found lying in the way, then settled himself upon the center of the bench so no one could share it with him. He glanced about with his eyes fierce in challenge of anyone who might have the temerity to try. Homer asked, Anything I can bring you, Frank? I just had dinner. What the hell could I want? Homer seated himself in a nearby chair, showing no reaction. He was more than a working partner. He was a friend from far back down the long years. Like Frank Claymore, he had always done as he damn well pleased, and it had never pleased him to acknowledge the unpleasant. Claymore studied the business-suited men passing through the gate of the white picket fence that surrounded the courthouse square, picking their way among the tied horses, the wagons, and buggies. His vision was still sharp when he looked into the distance. He could see the special prosecuting attorney and his own lawyer walking side by side, conversing pleasantly, apparently the best of friends. Claymore muttered again, When a man worked for you and accepted your pay, your enemies ought to be his enemies. He did not understand lawyers. He did not understand anybody who spent his days sheltered beneath a roof, dealing in intangibles such as law or accounts receivable, rather than something solid and real like cattle and horses. It was incomprehensible that two men could wrangle for hours in a courtroom and then shut off hostility at the moment of adjournment, like blowing out a lamp. He supposed his Anderson Avery was a good man, as lawyers went. At least he cost enough. But Claymore was not comfortable leaving his future in the hands of a man who had fought all his battles in the comfort of a courtroom, where the only blood he ever saw was in an opponent's eyes. 
Anderson Avery mounted the hotel steps and asked politely if Claymore had enjoyed his dinner. Claymore only grunted. Special prosecuting attorney Elihu Mallard looked past the old rancher, fastening his attention upon the screen door and passing through as quickly as he could. Afraid of me, Claymore thought with satisfaction. Outside of the courtroom, he ain't got the guts to look me in the eye. Inside the hotel lobby, Mallard declared, loudly enough for Claymore to hear, Sheriff, that man out there is on trial for his life. Why do you not have him in custody? The sheriff's voice was touchy. I got Willis keeping an eye on him. Anyway, he ain't fixin' to run off. I don't believe that old man ever ran from anything. Homer Whitcomb nursed a secret smile that often irritated Claymore almost to violence. For the twentieth time, he made reference to the prosecutor's name. Mallard, good handle for such a funny-looking duck. To Homer, anyone outside the cattle and horse fraternity was peculiar. Claymore grumped, I've looked at better men over the sights of a rifle. The banked coals of courtroom anger stirred to a glow. I wish it was still just the Indians. They faced you. These days you don't know who the enemy is half the time. They fight you with a pen instead of a gun. He picked up the newspaper but could read only the Dallas masthead. He passed it to Homer. You can still read without glasses. What does it say about me? You don't want to hear all them lies. Claymore demanded, read it. 